Studies after studies, countless studies, are done each year about psychiatric diseases, mental health, changing human behavioral patterns, and the brain, the human brain. But somehow, our commercial associations, our marketing strategies, our commercial companies fail to let the results be influenced by the very essential results that our science has been shown. Why so? What are the questions that are not being addressed? What are the questions that are not receiving funding for study? What are the questions that have to be addressed? And what are the questions that will lead us to a better future? A better, a truly better future for all of humanity. Welcome to our show, Talking Rain, with Mark A. Gunnier. Let me tell you today, our topic is emotion. And in every episode, we will talk about a topic and identify the most important questions that has to be asked, has to be asked, in every field that the topic relates to. Have you ever heard of people from older generations complaining about how today's young adults and adolescents are too reactive, depressed, moody, less driven, and needy? But what does it mean to be able to have good emotional regulation? And how does that impact one's psychological resilience? Emotional regulation was best defined and promoted by a peer-reviewed literature by Gross in 1998, when it was defined as, the process by which individuals influence which emotions they have, when they have them, and how they experience and express their feelings. Emotional regulation can be automatic or controlled, conscious, or unconscious, and may have effects at one or more points in the emotion producing process. It involves three components, initiating actions triggered by emotions, inhibiting actions triggered by emotions, and modulating responses triggered by emotions. These are excerpts from the literature. Other literature such as Levinson in 1999 then came to the conclusion that emotions are, as stated in this website article from Positive Psychology, are adaptive responses, rooted from evolutionary biology. Emotional regulation allows us to think about the reaction before performing it, in a form of impulse control. People with reduced ability to regulate their emotions are more prone to not only be highly reactive and moody but also be an easy victim for psychological disorders, more specifically speaking, mood disorders. So in other words, it is the efficiency of our ability to regulate emotions, actions, and decisions, which are tied in the brain, that determines, the status of our individual psychological resilience. We have been contacting teachers, counselors, professors, and psychologists that work in high schools and universities with graduate degrees asking one question, just one question, has there been a decline in psychological resilience in adolescents and young adults? These are the responses. Absolute decrease. Because of safetyism. We don't allow our kids to be in any danger or discomfort. They never learn to toughen up to the world, so everything is scary. Students think words are violence. There is no question in my mind that resiliency has decreased amongst adolescents and young adults. We have seen increased rates of suicide, substance abuse and anxiety and depression in young people in the last 20 years and I've seen that in my work frantically change over the last 13 years. 
The reason is a toxic mix of social media, video games, and cell phone addiction have emotionally crippled many kids and robbed them of crucial coping skills. I don't think as much resilience as they used to. Boys seem to be failing behind. They seem to freak out more over little things and I think stress has increased. I also think the pressure is greater. Girls are seeming to be more empowered and more resilient. I don't know for sure. I think it is most likely the same but young people have to deal with a lot more now. With social media, constant connections, more distractions. It's tough. Cameras everywhere. Resilience is hard to measure, though I know people try. I think people believe young people these days are less resilient. I am skeptical. Haven't seen any solid data. And then we ask some university students from different parts of the world. These are their responses. One student responded. My initial opinion would be that psych resilience of young adults has increased in these 20 years. We have more things we're worried and stressed about than previous generations. Another student responded. I think our generation is more aware of current events going on in a wider scale than 20 years ago. Things like climate change and oppression are some things that are worry currently. I remember reading somewhere that minimum wage for example has stayed around the same level for past several years but rent is increasing by a lot in the US. Stuff like that are something I feel young adults today have to deal with as the norm which wasn't as bad 20 years ago. Some students however also say that the resilience has decreased. These are some responses. One student responded. I personally think it decreased I'd say especially in the last 10 years. It sort of became a norm for young people to share their emotions through social media. I think more people back in the day used to expect people to keep their emotions to themselves but with growing understanding toward mental health, this is starting to change. While I do think that this is a good trend, it does seem like younger people are starting to lose the ability to deal with problems on their own. And psychologically probably more prone to damage in the long run as they have less experience in dealing with problems without sharing to the public. Another student responded. I feel like there is generally more awareness toward and recognition of mental health. So that might help. But at the same time, the higher relevance and constant presence of perfect images on social media is very destructive. So I actually think overall, resilience has decreased. And some students responded saying that a generalization is not possible. Here is how one student responded. I'd say nowadays we see a higher variance of resilience because of how difficult a time it is. There are probably more people going through and facing tough times but also more people who can't cope with things. Not sure if that's more of a cultural change amongst people or just due to different situations. Another student responded. Factors that the answer depends on are, geographical location, culture, parenting and family, friends, experiences in the first seven years of life. In essence, humans are social beings that require a healthy connection not only to maintain well-being but also to learn and grow in a healthy direction. In areas where the age of loneliness and the individualism phenomena became part of the underlying culture, the psychological resilience decreases. A third student responded, I guess we feel that psychological resilience has decreased because of new experiences with past expectations. Some students questioned some of the people that are of higher authority and judging students to have decreased psychological resilience, while not disagreeing. One student responded, Educational heads might be the ones that need to be psychologically resilient the most. I'm not sure psychological resilience can be taught. I feel it is more of a learning from experience kind of thing. I'm sure whoever is teaching is also going through it on a daily basis. A fairly recent article in Psychology Today discusses the issues often brought forward by teachers, professors, administration and other faculty of universities. These are some lines from the article. Students are increasingly seeking help for emotional crises over problems of everyday life. Students haven't developed skills in how to soothe themselves because their parents solved all their problems and removed their obstacles. Ergo, these instructors think students do not have additional problems compared to their historical reference point. And parents are so free in life with nothing to do, no overpriced tuitions to meet school and university, that they can sit around and take out obstacles for their children. In some cases this may be true but in most cases the parents are usually trying to juggle expenses and jobs to be able to meet extortion standards. They also mention, we have to give our children freedom, so they can practice being adults, practice taking responsibility for themselves. If you look through the lines they are saying to promote the individualism phenomena that one of the students described in their replies in the beginning of this episode. And soon enough, you will know exactly how instructors who think in this manner are absolutely incorrect. 
if you look at this part of the article without reading all the lines, it can be summarized simply as the instructor's point of view is that students are too weak emotionally and will blame their instructors for low grades. The student's point of view here is that what is good and what is bad when it comes to their studies is not distinguishable enough. They do not understand where they went wrong so they assume that the teacher did not do a good job and therefore they choose to complain. And so the discussions behind doors from the instructors and administrative side seem to be about achieving a balance between handholding these so-called needy and unwilling students or giving a buck up this is college response. This article then goes on to say that less resilient and needy students have shaped the landscape for faculty in that they are expected to do more handholding, lower their academic standards, and not challenge students too much. If you read the highlighted text in this slide, they also say students are afraid to fail, they do not take risks. Failure is seen as catastrophic and unacceptable. They are uncomfortable in not being right. They want to redo their earlier mistakes. Normalize being wrong and learning from one's errors. If you look through these lines, what is evident is that neuroscience and psychology of our current students do not play an important part in their discussions. What they are seemingly worried about are so-called academic standards, which is a politically correct word for school image, marketability, and profitability. Overall, what this article is saying is that many instructors and administrators have the notion that psychological resilience has decreased. However, what is evident is that the discussions on what action to take is not rooted on understanding the reasons behind it from the student perspective in a scientific manner but rather their own frustrations. One must wonder if their psychological resilience has decreased as well. Our focus today is on the scientific response to the experts' and students' observations that led them to conclude that psychological resilience has declined in adolescents and young adults. And so now, let's analyze how some of the observations and possible causalities noted by the experts and students affect emotional regulation and therefore, psychological resilience. Please welcome, today's guest, a prolific historian with a BA Honours and Masters in Ancient History, currently doing his PhD, Mr. Stefan Nitu. And please welcome once again, someone very important but you don't know it yet, because it is not time. You can never know with, with Marx. <laughs> There's always a, a stratum of humor and a stratum of seriousness and like many other strata that are just unrevealed. Marx Ashaki Elohi Kambiyama. An evolution in neuroscientific terms for a given for a given generation, let's say, is that, or is is it more or less the same? And really, what's happening is memory and the way we associate things and the way we process things, rather than the the, the actual brain itself. Yeah, I mean, the assumption is that uh, the brain structure by itself looks pretty similar, is from what I, what I understand, right. right? But we don't know how, what, what, what the changes are in terms of its internal parts, you know, like the, uh, the neural pathways, mm -hmm. it's a very complex thing, we don't, we don't know about the brain as much as we think we do, it's, it's yeah. an unknown organ. You know, it's not a very mm -hmm. well explored organ, I mean, although there are many studies on it, we're still very yeah. lacking on the topic. Yeah. And uh, the bringing uh, forward what you said about uh, you know evolutionary uh, changes in the brain, um, we were not, our brains were never used to so much dopamine at one time, you know? Mm -hmm. We're watching, we're uh, binge watching, you know, shows after shows, you know? We have <laughs> stuff like Netflix that say, please binge watch, when binge watching disorder is a disorder, addiction disorder in DSM-5. <laughs> <laughs> which is a manual, it's like the, the, the holy text for all of psychological disorders, and they say it's an it's a addiction behavior, it's, a, it's an addiction mm -hmm. behavior, but, but the, there are these companies that are promoting it as if, you know, it's a good thing. Right, wow. 
Mm. And also, my question is that could it be that we're, I mean, all this together is numbing our brains so much that um, there's little divisions we can make in the, our emotions? Mm. It's like there's more of a black and white in our emotions than it was before. Now, if you look through the DSM-5, even if you're not a science major or a, uh, a science professor or anything related to science, just look through the DSM-5. You can search on online. You can find a PDF version quite easily. You'll see that even after reaching the last page, there was not a mention of binge-watching disorder. But the reason I said it was part of the DSM-5 is because it has a lot of elements a lot of elements that are similarities with something that is included into the DSM-5, and that is binge eating disorder, which is also a binge disorder. And also, it matches some of the descriptions given to behavioral addictions, some general behavioral addictions that are non-substance abuse. And so, the reason it has not been included into the current version of DSM manual is because there's not enough research. There was not enough research to conclude the detriments of the uh, binge watching. And so we understand that it's important and it's integral for improvement of psychiatric treatments and psychiatric diagnosis because the DSM is the manual that helps the psychiatrists and psychologists find diagnoses for patients' psychological symptoms. So it is important that we keep on improving and keep on finding research and repeatedly finding the uh, results to be able to convince the DSM-5 keepers, the, the, the people in charge of making the DSM-5 to include certain things in the, the DSM-5 that will improve the treatment of something that is a, is a ongoing progress that is the field of psychology and psychiatry anyway that even though that binge watching disorder has not been included into the dsm-5 it does have the blatant detriments that are inclusive in many research-based studies and these are scientific studies i tell you and these are peer-reviewed so these are articles that portray someone's study and it has been approved and peer-reviewed by other big senior scientists with a lot of credibility and it is included in scientific journals and so that is the kind of information that we would like to use as uh, support for the arguments that we make in uh, the talking ring why is it that we binge watch we found out the reason why people binge watch first of all is the the creation and the uh, wanting, the yearning for the formation of one-sided unconscious bonds between the viewers and the characters. It uh, recreates a feeling of happiness. And now this is something that was alarming. I thought it was uh, quite evident. You will, people will agree. But the interesting thing about today is that if you see the people are using binge watching in these online platforms and, and these shows to create a sense of togetherness with these virtual characters in this virtual world. And people keep on repeatedly doing these things and centering their lives around binge watching and the shows they're binge watching, sidelining some of the most important things that in the past was crucial to human life, such as uh, your grades and your education and your social lives, your relationships, is because um, there is no apparent lack of physical side effects as a viewer. Unlike, unlike certain uh, things like binge eating disorder where there may be some physical side effects and you may uh, develop certain food related uh, other psychological disorders, the thing with uh, binge watching is that although you're taking killing time and in a way affecting yourself emotionally and when I mean in a way, it has been, there is enough support, as you can see in the research here, done in 2003, and later in 2015, and in 2014, and 
and many other research that I've not included yet, they have found that these kind of media habits have caused, although to alleviate some depressed moods for a short amount of time, it does increase a uh, uh, depression, the levels of depression and suicide ideation. They found that um, in 2005, they found that the levels of depression and suicide ideation were highest among the internet addicted group and internet addiction. Yeah, it is uh, used in the context of binge watching. And as you can see in this research right here, that uh, Sung in 2015 found that depression and loneliness were related to binge, watch, uh, binge watching as we d talked about here. And so the thing with binge watching is that, um, as I summarized here very well, is that on the journey to escape loneliness and low self-esteem, these binge watchers and compulsive internet users lose self-regulation of their own emotions and become more passive, hence the depression and possible suicide ideation. And uh, they become more passive and they chase illusions of the unconscious bonds and achievement. Let's talk about the neuroscience behind binge watching. And I'll put this as simply as I can. When we watch an episode of a show we like, we feel happy. Why is it that we feel happy? We feel happy because there is a neurotransmitter in the brain known as dopamine that is released. We watch another episode, a certain amount of dose of dopamine is released. We watch another episode, another certain amount of dose of dopamine is released in the brain. Eventually, the dopaminergic receptors, the thing that the dopamine connects to for you to be happy, is occupied, relatively occupied. And so you have a plateau where, although you're clicking on the next episode out of habit, it's not making you happier. There is not that sense of heightening happiness. And eventually, you start feeling down. And you eventually stop watching. That happens because your body is now going from releasing dopamine to making dopamine so that it can release dopamine later on. So, when we are going through the stage, we're in a temporary depletion of dopamine of sorts and at that time according to this peer of your article that you can see right here there is an upregulation of the renin angiotensin system the renin angiotensin system is a system that is responsible for water retention wa water excretion and uh, stress the control of stress and this is hyperactivated to compensate for the de dopamine depletion. And so at this time, when there's this hyperactive RAS system, this RAS, there is a exacerbation, exacerbation of oxidative stress. And that means there's a heightening of oxidative stress and at that time, there are some dopaminergic neuron losses. Now you may be wondering, what does the heightening of oxidative stress mean? Well, oxidative stress can cause many things. First of all, as I said, it can cause dopaminergic neuron loss. It can cause the decrease, a transient decrease in immunity. It can also cause the increased production of oxygen radicals, which can increase your chances of having cancer. You may be also wondering, what is this dopamine? What is, what is it doing? Now, dopamine is involved in the reward pathway, which is why we feel happy. But it is also part of that same pathway that has other functions such as control of movement and error signaling for uh, reward prediction, motivation, and cognition, which is involved in the emotional regulation as well as the, the regulation of whether to do or not to do. And that is why, 
increase in these dopamine depletion phases by binge watching and increasing dopaminergic neuron loss, would cause decline in emotional regulation and therefore, psychological resilience, in adolescents and young adults. In the beginning of this episode, when we showed you the responses of highly educated teachers, professors, uh, counselors, psychologists and students, the people who said that there had been a decrease in psychological resilience in adolescents and young adults, they said that one of the reasons, one of the reasons could be social media. So what is it about social media that could have caused a decrease in psychological resilience? The key concept that plays the role is the element of social comparison. Now social comparison is something that is quite evident if you go on any social media site like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, even uh, TikTok and YouTube. As you can see in this slide, I have posted excerpts from this one article that references many other articles uh, that are from the uh, journals that we have in the slide right here, such as the personality and individual differences, cyber psychology, behavior and social networking and human communication research, as well as sage journals. So in this we see that there is an excerpt here, right here, that says, uh, for instance, Dave uh, Devry and Kone, sorry if I'm pronouncing the names wrong, but in 2015, they conducted a survey study among young adults in the Netherlands and demonstrated that high intensity of Facebook use was associated with more social comparison. A similar relationship was also found in a study of Instagram demonstrating that social media can predict individual differences in social comparison, orientation, and behavior. Now, another survey, I'll read it right out of the text. Another survey also showed that when people perceive their social media friends as having better lives, their self-reported self-esteem level was lower. Their self-esteem level was lower. Now, visual content creates higher impression formation by escalating social presence. Now, that is just another, uh, just another quotation from the journal article. The reason I'm reading direct quotes from this, uh, from the, the article, is so that you can see that what I'm saying is not just opinions. It's not just my opinions. These are studies that has been done, and these are things that has been said in the literature. And when social media promotes social comparison through trends, and that's in visual content like in Instagram or in YouTube, then you have higher impression of escalating social presence, which means that you're seeing someone that visually looks in a better social status than you. So it creates a divide in social status in your mind. That means you want to replicate or you want to follow what's in the trend so that you look like you are of a, a high status community. Now, as you can see here in, uh, in this article in 2001, as you can see in this quote in this article, over time, the excessive self-consciousness as a result of social comparison could lead to one's perception of lack of social skills and even fear of social interaction. So what does that mean? So that means that it makes people not want to interact with people directly, first of all, and secondly, and most importantly, it lowers self-esteem. So people who are so engaged in social media have to stay on with the trends to feel like they're a, among the high status people. Social media users often compare themselves with others appearance, ability, popularity and social skills. And that is something that is an issue. Because as said in this 2018 article, such a comparison triggers strong psychological responses, particularly when others selectively present more positive information. Please note that carefully. And here, in another highlighted portion, I says, 
It says that in 2016 article from Jang, our finding indicated that social comparison significantly, significantly decreased self-esteem. This result is consistent with previous studies. Now that is important in science because you want to have repeated, repeated support for a argument. This shows that individuals with higher social comparison orientation report poorer self-perception, lower self-esteem, and more negative feelings. And here in the yellow highlighted portions, you can see that they also talk about what I have already mentioned, about how people want to normalize to the trends, to be able to feel like they're of higher status so that they can increase their self-esteem. If you see this in this one article here, our stu their study found that lower self-esteem was associated with greater social anxiety, finding the echoes with previous research, prior research. And as one's self-esteem falls, the person's perceived inferiority, inferiority may prompt negative, negative navigation and interpretation of reactions from social networks, such perceived disapproving responses would increase social anxiety. So what we understand here is that when it comes to social media, the key concept that is responsible for declining of psychological resilience is social comparison by causing social anxiety. So as in the beginning, one of the responses by a student said that the decrease in psychological resilience may be more common in these cultures that promote individualism rather than in the cultures that are more collectivists. And so in this article, they reference Wajda from a 2018 article saying that Wajda contended that the difference in the level of social comparison was rooted in the individualism, collectivism, cultural difference. Individuals from Eastern societies with a collectivist culture are more apt to hold an interdependent view of self and others. So basically, some cultures that are more into the individualism phenomena is highly prone to social comparison. That being said, could it be that the westernization of most global cultures have brought this onto them as well? But how does heightened social anxiety and lower self-esteem due to overwhelming social comparison through social media contribute toward a decline in the efficiency of emotional regulation and therefore psychological resilience? Keep watching and we will tell you soon. And have you noticed how nowadays um, baby fashion is literally Adult. Oh, it's bad adult version. It's adult, it's adult yeah. fashion that's just made yeah, into I've like noticed. small. Yeah, I've noticed. That yeah. was not the case before. That was so not the case. You did they sell baby belts? It's like a nice, nice little belt to go with his little trousers and uh, you know, shirt and collar and it's like really? I mean, sure, the baby's gonna be cute, but what's the subliminal message there? It's like, hey, you're ready for adulthood. You're, you're three years old with breaking records. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So why is it that children's fashion resemble that of the adults? It's quite simple, really. If you look into this article right here, written by Luna Journal, a famous fashion-based journal, H&M, one of the most famous mass clothing brand, has said that the million millennial parents have a different demand. They make completely different demands on the baby and the children's clothing market today than the generations before them. Millennials are more trend conscious. So this makes it crystal clear that the concept, the increasing concept of social comparison that I have described a few moments before comes into play. And here we see that parents are making their children wear clothing that resemble adult clothing fashion because they want their children to look in social status higher than other children who are dressing up more children-like. It is all 
accredited to the definition that we have used for children for years, for many decades. A definition that has been described in this article for which the links are right below. And here the article says, the definition of children as a developmental stage and psychological state masks the fact that it is still a social status. So what it's saying is that children are thought of to be of a lower social status. And because childhood is defined as a stage or state of incapacity, children are thought to be incapable of exercising adult rights. And therefore, people who dress up like adults are emulating that aura of adulthood and therefore they're seeming to be in a higher social status with higher capa capabilities than the average children or the children that wear children's clothing. We must also keep in mind that there are now a lot of Instagram models and Instagram uh, famous children who are dressing up with the adult fashion, meaning the fashion that are resembling that of adults. And therefore, we are looking, we have the whole generation that are using social media at such a young age. They are looking at these people, these people that look like them in age and height. So these children see that people are giving followers, lots and lots of followers, likes on social media to these children who are wearing adult resembling clothes. And when they see that, they come to the conclusion that you only get the respect, you only get the following and the attention. The same social status as adults is if you dress up like adults. And you can see this concept throughout many articles, some of which has been described in this slide right here. And that being said, we must always importantly remember that children also have emotions. They're, also, they're at a developing stage where they have a lot of emotions. And as they grow up, they'll have even more emotions throughout puberty. And so we must understand that this kind of social media influence and this kind of social comparison with fashion can send a subliminal emotional pressure to emulate behavior and responsibilities of adults. Now, some people may think this is a good thing. They're training their children to be adults and take responsibilities from an early age. But that's not reasonable. Let's think about it. The brain has not even developed yet. The brain is still developing and you're already giving them responsibilities and subliminal messages to become adults before even they had the time to make their own mistakes and live out the wrongs and the rights. You must understand they're in a developing stage, they're developing their emotional regulation and their psychological resilience. So we must not intervene. We must learn to put the future beyond commercialism. But why is pressuring the natural development into adulthood detrimental? Besides that fact that children lose their childhood, a time of preparation for their adult lives. What does the increased anxiety from this pressure do? Be patient and keep watching. Now I want to bring in the, the more taboo topics. Like mm -hmm. the rise of HD pornography and is um, very, what's the word? Vivid, not vivid. Um, not clear. Uh, clear and uh, what's it called? Very uh, graphic. That's the word. Uh -huh. Graphic. <laughs> very graphic uh, portrayals of things that are not true about um, sexual relations. You know, mm -hmm. it's all it's all fiction, but they're selling it so much that it's. 
uh, seeming like it's supposed to be what it's supposed to look like. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of people maybe from developed countries or developing countries are watching these kind of things, and that is causing the numbingness. Or be- because imagine, imagine the mm-hmm. excess dopamine getting from something that you're supposed to work hard for getting. You know? Right. <laughs> right. That's a good point. I love so that. My question is that could it be that this is affecting or uh, this is affecting brains of many people, but we don't know it because we don't look for it, and that may be affecting our uh, the, our people's processes uh, through, uh, mm-hmm. when it comes to emotion and um, uh, when it when it comes to uh, emotional intelligence. What is your comment on that? No one takes any action about it. Yes, or, or, so there's, there's this, this disconnect that like, I don't even know. Have 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 they done studies on this? Is the, is there any researcher who actually was willing to risk their uh, reputation and dignity in a sense because it's not seen as a, 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 a as a accepted thing to do research? I, I found a, st- a statistic at some point that said that the the industry and the you know the amount of um, clicks and visitors per month or per year, I don't know what it is, um, is bigger than Netflix. And this is the article that Mr. Nito was talking about, where the estimate revenue for the pornographic industry is a lot greater than big entertainment sources like Hollywood, NBA, Netflix, and so on. Now, why is it that we're talking about the revenue created by the pornographic industry? Just in case you're wondering, it is not because Stefan Nito wants to create his own company. That is not the reason. The real reason behind it is that we seem to neglect. We seem to neglect the overwhelmingly blatant, blatant influences and detriments that the viewership, the wide viewership, the billions and billions of viewership that pornography is receiving has on our adolescents and young adults' minds. And I brought this over so that I can explain to you through peer-reviewed articles, peer-reviewed articles that are in the minimum. The reason it's in the minimum, it's sort of a taboo thing, like Mr. Nitu has explained. People might not want to go research about this because uh, it may put their name on the line, maybe. But doing research on this type of material is very important because we can't just ignore that it's not there it has been there for a very long time and has become videographic and it becomes it became hd it became available and free and here comes the issue is that when you have something so available then you want to know what are its detriments but perhaps because of the industry making so much money People just don't want to research on this. But the, from the limited amount of research that has been done, we can conclude certain things. When there was an fMRI done with participants being shown short videos with explicit material, sexually explicit material, they were monitored through the fMRI, the functional MRI, to scan the brain of what regions light up and light up means which regions has neural activity. Neural activity means what is happening that is causing the response that participants have in this study. So we, they have found that the regions that are activated in the fMRI in the brain are those that are also activated in substance abusers. Now here, we have another excerpt explaining that the current and extent Findings suggest that a common network exists for sexual Q reactivity and drug Q reactivity in groups of CSB, compulsive sexual behavior and drug addictions, respectively. These findings suggest overlaps in networks underlying disorders of pathological consumption of drugs and natural rewards. That means that the same thing that is happening when someone is taking heroin, same effect in terms of the brain is having by the viewership of pornography. Now another important thing beyond this is what is pornography doing to the developmental phases of the brain? And as far as 
pornography and the use of porn, excessive use of pornography being in the DSM-5, it is not there because once again, more studies are needed. And this is crucial. And that is the most crucial because the psychological department, as I said, psychiatry department, the diagnosis in treatments of such things will not improve if you don't have repeated studies that cause conclusions to be able to be drawn. And so here you can see that, first of all, some of the major areas that light up when someone is watching pornography is the, the areas of ventral striatum, dorsal singlet, and amygdala. The amygdala is very much responsible for emotional regulation and the production of emotion. And here the dorsal cingulate, the cingulate gyrus, is mainly responsible for the production of new memories. It's part of the pevis circuit. And the ventral striatum being part of the basal ganglia is important for the control, the regulation of motor responses. But as you can see, there are other supplementary functions that are performed by these areas because the brain is very interconnected and so are these structures. So in this study, they compared participants who are exhibiting compulsive sexual behavior and healthy volunteers that are not exhibiting compulsive sexual behavior. And their study was about what would happen if the CSB subjects versus the healthy volunteers saw pictures of sexual explicit material versus videographic sexual explicit material. So as you can see here, in explicit, meaning the videographic, content. The red signifying the CSB subjects had a higher activity in their ventral striatum, in their dorsal cingulate, and in their amygdala than in the healthy participants. In terms of the exciting the photos, photos of sexually explicit material, the healthy people had a better response than people who were CSB subjects. You can see right here where the red is lower than the black line. And that is true in the ventral striatum, the dorsal cingulate, and the amygdala. And now you may see that the y-axis over here, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, that seems like it could be like small values, but in terms of the brain, small values mean a lot. And uh, we're talking about percentage, and 0.1% is a lot of electrical difference. And for further support, we have also seen uh, sources like Galenat from JAMA Psychiatry, Brain Structure and Functional Connectivity Associated with Pornography Consumption here, um, that they, when they reference this source, they say that longer duration of use of online explicit materials and healthy males have shown to correlate with lower left putaminal activity, left putaminal activity, the, the putamen, is part of the, the basal ganglia, controls the motor response, and uh, just like the striatum, and they actually work together. And uh, to, to brief still explicit images, suggesting a potential role of desensitization. So uh, there is a correlation of the usage of long duration videographic pornography to lower left pitominal activity, suggesting the potential role in desensitization. And so, although more research is always needed, longer exposure desensitizes according to what we have. So what this means is, once again, the dopamine depletion concept is coming to play. As we talked about regarding the binge watching same concept plays here where dopamine depletion over time can cause dopaminergic neuron losses and that could cause desensitization. Now, have you ever wondered why pornography is known as 18 plus content? Why is it known as 18 plus content? Could it be that if people under age, under the age of 18, see such content, their brain development may be altered? Well, that is exactly the case. But the problem is, it should never have been 18 plus content. It should have been mid 20s or 25 plus content. Because our brains are the most important parts of our brains that allows 
emotional regulation and in the long term psychological resilience is highly dependent on the connections, the pathways that are myelinized, pathways that are developed during puberty and well into the mid 20s. As this article here in 2014 had said, the maturation of frontal cortical gray matter involved in executive control persists in adolescent into the mid 20s, into the mid 20s. Yet this content is known as 18 plus content. Quite astonishing. Now, in this uh, excerpt, we also see that it says that enhanced, enhanced risk taking in adolescents may reflect earlier development of limbic incentive motivation and reward circuitry relative to a more delayed development of frontal executive control systems involved in monitoring or inhibiting behaviors. So what does this mean? What it means is that people who are risk takers, risk taking people, They may have a manipulation in their natural progression of the, the developing brain. And now if you read the other excerpt, it says that adolescents have demonstrated great ventral striatal activity relative to the prefrontal cortical activity during the reward processing compared to adults. Here we observe that across subjects, young age is associated with greater ventral striatal activity to sexually explicit cues. This effect in ventral striatal activity appears particularly robust in CSB subjects. Once again, CSB means compulsive sexual behavior subjects, suggesting a potential modul modulatory role of age on responses to sexual cues in general and in CSB specifically. So what does this mean? What it means is again, that early exposure, exposure of pornography during this developmental neural stages can cause certain anomalies in their brains that can change the normal response of human psychology. Then why isn't internet pornography regulated to that extent, instead of promoting these psychological disorders? And why are people at younger age than ever before being able to access pornography? The business model, that's the thing, is the business model, it can say, oh, I mean, there's no reason to regulate the website or to take the website down because sure. it works like any content sharing website. That's just what people want to share on it. <clears throat> and you can be a private person who just wants to upload a video about it your own cat and you can share that so in the same way legally there's absolutely nothing stopping people from saying this is just the website for sharing people some things that people want to share and if some of the people on that website are actual producers and in, in like filmmakers and stuff they can share the hd stuff mm -hmm. so that then means there's absolutely no legal basis to do anything about it and like for example if you want to enforce who gets to see that stuff you know if you want to protect minors let's say well the only way you can do that is by the government essentially requiring some sort of like really invasive surveillance system where they have to track your movements online they have to know who you are they have to know your age and so forth and they you, you know you have to like buy a pass let's say for example if you're an adult and you want to deal with that stuff you buy a pass <clears throat> from the government or from the agency that controls that but in a sense that opens up millions of other problems that people are not going to be happy about so then there's no way to regulate it and also make people happy so it's completely free, it's so easy to access, and there's not really much of a solution because people don't even want to start thinking about a solution. If someone were to look into it, they would probably find a correlation between the, the amount of stuff that people watch and the increase in divorce, the increase in uh, people reporting being unhappy 
you know, with their with their sex life, people being subjected to do things that they wouldn't want to do, people cheating on another on each other. I don't really know. Um, it's something that needs urgent attention. Nobody cares about it. Um, or rather, everybody cares about it, but they care about it only so that they can be seen as understanding it, but not act- actively doing much. Mm-hmm. Like um, also, um, uh, there uh, and the millions and the millions of people watching these things. You know, uh, so let's say they're students, right? Yeah. What is going to happen to them in school when? You know, they're they're you know these um, they they have these brains that are like resembling heroin addicts, mm-hmm. but they don't understand they don't understand what happened the changes that happened in their brain. You know, to all the years of due to the, all the years of uh, increased uh, you know increased, yeah, yeah. Uh, what is it called what do we call it you know, um, consumption yeah increased uh, and, diving in I mean diving into deeper depths of this. Uh, um, media of this uh, world. So some of the key possible causes that we discussed so far is that being overly surrounded by social comparison, commercialization and social pressures of consumers to binge videos at young age and beyond, early exposure to video graphics, explicit material and their effects, and over-reliance on outside help that was talked about and uh, responded by some of the students in the beginning of the episode. This and many more sum up to an enhanced perception of anxiety. So that explains why we have young adults and adolescents facing more anxiety today than before. Particularly, like you said, in this time period when we're most susceptible to all these changes happening in our brain, uh, well, some of these induced linkings and associations can be very difficult to understand, to deal with, to yeah. rehabilitate within their large place. You know, there's, there's a place and a time for everything, but if certain things, certain messages are being, you know, beamed at you at all times, um, like you said with dopamine, um, I'm not versed in some of the other uh, how should I say, neuro, neuroscientific triggers and reactions and yeah. what they're called in a sense, but I can tell you for a fact, you know, that stress, for example, stress is now inbuilt in everything that we do. And you can't be a hardworking businessman unless you wake up at 5 a.m. because that's when all CEOs wake up and that's what you see on every news report about how to live like a CEO. You wake up at 5 a.m. and you deal with every single thing that life throws your way and it doesn't matter how stressed you are by the end of the day because you're going to make a fortune. And now we tell you about the injustice that has been done or will be done to you. We tell you what exactly all of this additional stress, anxiety, and other effects we discussed, do, did, or will do to cause the decline in emotional regulation and therefore the decline in psychological resilience. The problem might be uh, in the fact that they, they're not being able to move on from a certain stage. You know, you see, for example, uh, in the adolescent stage, um, your, your amygdala, you know, the part of the brain, yeah. it's a bit, I mean, it's, I've read that it's a bit enlarged, you know. Uh, so, um, the, and the connection between the, the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala is not as well, I mean, as well as it becomes later on. So, yeah. your, uh, your regulation over your emotion is not as good. Do you think we're being stuck in an adolescent stage? Is that a possible reason why, you know, so many people are having uh, lower uh, control over their emotions? Mm. I like that. That's interesting. Um, I wouldn't know much about the chemistry of it. Um, this is where you come in with your expertise. <laughs> but there is definitely a disconnect, I think, between what people perceive as their transition into adulthood and what actually happens to them as they transition from teenagers to adults. And although I 
thought that I was the first one to come up with this novel, beautiful idea. Another psychologist has already thought about it, uh, unfortunately. It was uh, Eric Erickson, who in his theory on the different stages of human development, terms this stage of not being able to uh, move on from the uh, puberty, psychosocial moratorium. A uh, Columbia University psychiatrist, Mirjana Mirjana uh, Doma Konda. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, but this person has said uh, 25 is the new 18 and delayed adolescence is no longer a theory, but a reality. In some ways, we're all in a psychosocial moratorium, experimenting with a society where swipes constitute dating and likes are the equivalent of conversation. And here in this excerpt that I have copied and pasted onto the slide, you can see in this 2015 study, in this portion that I highlighted, that adolescents exhibited initially exaggerated amygdala activity in response to fearful facial expressions relative to children and adults. This, the extent to which the exaggerated response diminished over time was associated with anxiety measure in the youth. So why I've read those two parts is because when it comes to the neural development of the brain, there is a exaggerated amygdala activity, activity when we are in puberty, but that diminishes as the, as the connection between the amygdala and the cortex and the other structures that allow the emotional regulation as they begun, begin to develop, this exaggerated activity diminishes. But as you can see here, it is highly dependent on anxiety measures during the youth, meaning from 16 to 25. Continuing with the excerpt, this suggests that although exaggerated emotional reactivity is evident in adolescence, the maladaptive pattern of non-diminished amygdala activity is associated with high levels of anxiety. And that means that when you are facing higher levels of anxiety during those developmental ages, that means you're stuck. In a way, you're stuck in puberty. You're stuck in puberty in the sense that your amygdala is still hyperactive. In another source, Van Dooj Van Hood and colleagues, I'm sorry if I pronounced that name wrong, uh, reported that learning rate was associated with intrinsic connectivity between the DLPFC, it's a part of the prefrontal cortex, and subcortical regions, means the regions that are below the cortex. This, this association increased over time with increasing age in 8 to 25 year olds. Simultaneously decreased connectivity between the DLPFC and motor areas was associated with better cognition and increased age, which may be related to increasing motor inhibition and impulse control with age. So as you can see, we were supposed to develop impulse control. We're supposed to develop emotional regulation. All these control me mechanisms that make sure that we don't become highly reactive, that we don't become unmotivated, that we don't become overly depressed or having other mood disorders. All these pathways that helps us achieve that is being affected, manipulated by the high dosage of anxiety that is received during those developmental stages, as well as the kind of effect that is there from entertainment sources such as that of binge watching, that of pornography, that of social comparison by social media. There are an estimate of 792 million people diagnosed with a psychological disorder globally. Imagine how many people are not being diagnosed or being misdiagnosed because their condition is not officially considered a disorder.
Who do you go to? What do you do? When do you, do you pick up the prospectus and start reading it for instructions? And in the, there's not going to be instructions for that sort of stuff in the prospectus. <laughs> Uh, and so if, if those people then struggle, I think that in the end they come off all the better for it. You know, that, that, that struggle, in a sense, it, these are negative emotions, but it's good. I mean, if it's good if you come out of it, what happens to those yes. that do yeah. not come out of it? Then, because if you don't help the help or mm -hmm. be able to help yourself, you know, get the, uh, get the knowledge somehow to help yourself, if you can't do that, then you fall down the... Yep, yep. Cliff, whatever it is, yeah. Then what happens? Yeah, everybody moves on without you, and, and not, not in the sense that the other ones are much better developed. Um, right. They, they just think that they are, and the system agrees with them until eventually they get into a particular job and then they're 40, and that's why we have midlife crises. Uh, because <laughs> all these other people have breezed through life, they haven't really been challenged in any way, and then all of a sudden they sit at their office job uh, one morning and they see the pretty flowers outside in the park, and they just think to themselves, well, wait a minute, why, why am I here? <clears throat> But the, those, the people that struggle and if those people, if they don't receive um, <clears throat> proper help, the, the outcome then I think depends <clears throat> precisely on what you have brought up for yourself up until that point. If you don't have outside help, right? And many people nowadays go to counseling, therapy, that sort of stuff. But similarly, many people hate it. It's a stranger. You, you, you go and talk to a stranger uh, about like your most intimate and fearful experiences. So people then rely on their own strength of character that they built up up until that point. And for some people, they can see that it's a problem, that they're struggling, but they can also see that this might be temporary, that, you know, let me talk to my parents, let me talk to my mom, let me just go out every day, take a walk in the morning and try to feel better in the fresh air and that sort of stuff. And so they have mechanisms in place. They have a mentality that says, this is tough, but I, it, it's, it's important. I'm welcoming it, it's, it's needed. Um, and that can come from a variety of factors. It can come from like their um, upbringing and how they react to things that have happened to them in the past. It can come from having good role models. Uh, but then there's people that would be very close to having these reactions and to dealing with the problem in a good way, but they haven't experienced anything like this before. Um, and so when you're put in a situation where you've, you haven't dealt with at all in your life, the first reaction that you're going to have is panic. Um, so if you don't go and if you don't get over the panic, that can spiral. And the problem, you know, all these institutions are built for stuff like progress, success, uh, economic achievement, all the stuff that no one tells you to your face anymore. Hmm. But it's true. Um, so if you don't already have all your coping mechanisms with you, the uh, place you're in, uh, you know, we're using the example of the university, <clears throat> the university is just going to leave you by the curb because Sure, they have a counseling service in place for you, and sure, they might have like a peer-to-peer -peer network where you can go and share your stories, and sure, they might have like a little, um, I don't know, trinkets of um, compliance, really, is what I call them. They're, they're complying with the law and with the bare minimum, but other than that, they're going to put the other, all the other people on a pedestal, they're going to leave you behind. They don't care about you because it's a numbers game. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you hear um, universities are judged by how, what percentage of the students that graduate get into a job, any job, doesn't matter if like that person is happy in their job or if they're performing well, <clears throat> or if their job is um, um, commensurate with the level that they graduated at, you know, it, it could be like, uh, I don't know, what's an example of a, of a useless job? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're good at this. Useless job. Useless job. Well, I can make a menu, but uh, I can't say on camera. <laughs> There's a book by uh, by this guy called David Graeber. He's an economist at LSE. It's called Bullshit Jobs. <laughs> so what he does is he he takes testimonies from people, like thousands and thousands and thousands of people that have sent messages and emails and so on and that sort of stuff and they, they describe how bullshit their jobs are. <laughs> but it doesn't matter to the people that make the numbers because if 94% of a graduating class um, is enrolled in some form of um, job in the workforce within six months of graduation, that is an unparalleled success and we should all be clapping. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hmm. yeah. So. It, you know, you're essentially expected to rely on your own um, emotional and mental capacities, even at this very important stage where, like you said, this definitive jump is being made for your emotional faculties to emerge as complete, as adult, as they can be. So it's the stage where you would need the most care and the most guidance turns out to be the stage where everyone expects it to be fully formed already. Yeah. And then we see 12 year olds that are essentially turn into 18 year olds way too quickly because that's the other way that these people can cope is well, I have all this pressure on me. I'm not, you know, university and figuring out my identity and my style and you know fitting right. in with the world and like all that sort of stuff because no one helps you with that when you chemically need it um you start to try and prepare yourself for it at a much earlier age and you don't understand what the heck is going on and all of a sudden like i said you see these 12 year olds walking around with all this makeup on and they look like 18 year olds and they talk like 18 year olds and sure some people again Nothing is good or bad. For some people, it works. For other people, I think you're giving up your childhood, which is a crime. I agree. One thing, I don't know why. It doesn't even matter how hard you try. Time is a valuable thing. Watch it count down as the pendulum swings. Hey, no, I won't let it 
change me. You can't take my youth away. The soul of mine will never break. As long as I wake up today, you can't take my youth away. You can't take my youth away. The soul of mine will never break. As long as I wake up today, you can't take my youth away. You can't take my youth away. Some of the most important questions that we are faced with and we must research about is how much percent of the world's young adults still has decreased connection between the PFC and the amygdala that is supposed to increase with age in their natural development? How much percent has a uh, hyperactive amygdala even in their later stages? How can medical experts help them? And so for this, we don't, we don't want just surveys. We need empirical evidence because science works on empirical evidence and we need some measurable result. And for that, a mass global longitudinal study might be required, but that is required and that is needed in urgency. Does pornography affect detrimentally only to people with certain type of neural activity or connections or all people? We need a progressive a mass global longitudinal study on this very important because as this content is free even if it's highly regulated you won't be able to stop these younger people that are 13 12 10 11 14 15 these people accessing such material during their their neural developmental stages how does early exposure to pornography affect the neural connection between the PFC and amygdala after the age of mid-twenties? So after the age of 25, what happens to that connection? Is that connection fully established after the age of 25? Or does it stay less established than it would be normally? Does the amygdala hyperactivity decrease to the extent it would? if there was a normal progression of neural development? These are all very important questions. And why is binge eating disorder on DSM-5 but not binge watching disorder? When the principle behind it is it is the same. Now I already answered why. It's because of insufficient research. And that's why we need more research. And so by putting this question here, I just want to use it as a reminder that we want more research done on binge watching disorder. Has emotional dysregulation caused by delay in neurological development that should be completed in adolescence and in early adult stages corresponding to psychological resilience decreased in people with genetic predisposition for anxiety disorders only or with people without genetic predispositions equally? And this is very important because one of the most argued topics is that is it the chicken or the egg that comes first? Meaning, is it the brain that's already predisposed to such uh, behaviors, such as the compulsive sexual behavior, or or is it this the sexual content that, uh, or the uh, possible causes that we discussed in this episode that may be causing the changes in the brain? Now, when it comes to the research that we discussed. For that to be solidified, we need more research. And here we cannot stress how much research is important. Peer reviewed research is so important for the future progression of humanity as thinking beings. It is very important. And so even though it's not profitable, we must find a way to do these studies without money and when and when scientists and psychologists and psychiatrists neurologists are doing such research volunteer because you're not losing losing respect even if you are a, a compulsive sexual behavior it will not disrespect you because it is not a crime it is a condition of the brain so i say this that if you see a study happening go there volunteer help them help those researchers get information because it will only help us as an entirety in the end because if they don't if you guys don't go then they'll have to offer you money and that money needs budget and that budget needs funding 
and that funding is not always readily available. And I think uh, it's something that we, we should keep questioning ourselves when in our daily lives so that we can we ourselves can keep ourselves healthy and be able to regulate our emotions a bit better. And um, the question still remains, how do we fix all these gaps to uh, have a have these, uh, this population, this huge population of disturbed people with uh, psychological disorders, with personality disorders, or whatever factors that cause them. How do we, what do we do to keep them away from having diseases and diseases, and how do we, um, how do we fix them? And um, there are uh, solutions out there that, um, that are very uh, questionable as well, and we will question them on another episode with uh, <laughs> with another person or with the same person. I haven't decided yet. I'm just speaking. Okay. Anyway, thanks for the thanks for the episode, brother. And let me tell you all, you know, always show love. Always show love to your friends, family, exactly. your siblings. You know, because um, a relationship. Strangers is, too. Strangers, 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 strangers need to be loved too. Give small compliments every once in a while. Listen to what people have to say, even if you don't agree or fully understand them. The key is to help them get to a mental state where they can understand their own problems better. Help them, help themselves. Make sure they are not having suicidal thoughts or feeling unimportant. Show them why they are special to you. People are a plant. A relationship is a plant, and if you don't water it from time to time, it'll die. So always remember, what are your flowers? And let's all make a beautiful garden here together. Thank you. And with this... In the rain. <laughs> in the rain. So anyway, with this, I exit. We will see you on the next episode. Thank you. All right. Thank you.